I, um, I went to work at J.P. Morgan right out of college in 1982 when J.P. Morgan was Morgan Guarantee Trust Company, which was a extremely well-respected, highly ethical, um, uh, kind of rock-solid anchor institution of the global economy. And I went there because I was somewhat idealistic about um, how economics was going to become the organizing medium of the global international of, of international relations. I had been an international relations major. I took a course on the uh, international economic relations, and I switched majors, focused on economics. And so I, my path, I thought, would be go work at Morgan, kind of work my way up in the firm, learn about finance, and then go work in the World Bank someday and, and save the world. And it's sort of like a funny thing happened on the way to the dance, you know, and, and then they, the world invented derivatives, and before I knew it, I was flying out to Tokyo, newly married. I landed in Japan with a one-way ticket. The first week, a yen-yen interest rate swap happened on planet Earth. And that's a good time to arrive in Tokyo as the new head of the swap department. Um, and so at a very young age, you know, I was sort of swept into this highly creative, highly energetic, highly exciting, uh, transformative business called swaps, then now known as derivatives, which truly transformed the way global finance worked. And it, it connected all of the national capital markets together uh, through a web of contracts that essentially um, uh, locked the arbitrage between uh, domestic capital markets into one global market. And we used to call swaps the highway of finance. Before I knew it, our generation of, of, of um, you know, we were kids at the time, ended up rising up in the bank to basically run all the capital markets. Because if you didn't understand derivatives, you couldn't run capital markets. And so, um, you know, I was a young, successful guy at, at Morgan and, um, and, and enjoyed that success, and, uh, but grew increasingly restless with the business. Um, it's funny to look back, if you look at a chart of the growth of derivatives, you know, I got, I got out of it in um, 1995 because I thought it was matured and all the excitement was done and it was a mature, dull, grinded out kind of business. And if you look at a chart on the growth of derivatives now, 95 is like down here. Um, so my timing wasn't, wasn't too smart. But I, I wanted to get into the group we called Morgan Capital to learn how to invest private capital. And it was really just a gut feel. And when I first moved into Morgan Capital, um, they asked me, so what do you want to do? Uh, and, and thinking that I didn't know anything about investing capital, which was probably true. Um, and I picked the education industry and the alternative energy industry. And so that's where the idea first started in my mind about the, the idea of aligning capital with social environmental purpose. And it was very much an intuitive thing. Not, I didn't have any theory of change. I didn't have any knowledge of impact investing. And so the first investment I made was in the Edison Schools Project, which is a, a for-profit charter school company. And, and um, uh, I got very passionate about the whole school reform challenge. And um, uh, so to make a long story short, Morgan got bought by Chase. Um, by then, I was running the, uh, the Lab Morgan investment team, which was at the center of technology and financial services, which was the, this was during the, the dot-com craze. And I was just burnt out and tired of it. And I knew that there was something really wrong with the way finance worked. I really didn't like venture capital business much. Um, it was, um, it was pretty much a, a nonstop fight and um, very little regard for the entrepreneurs and much more regard for how capital could optimize the value that the entrepreneurs brought to the table. But I had a real um, appreciation for the value of entrepreneurs and the power of entrepreneurial activity. I became an impact investor and I was sort of, you know, kind of dabbling in stuff. I got very interested in the, um, the food system issues and, and learned about the ecosystem crisis in a way that um, I had ne no appreciation of it before. I learned about it as a systemic crisis. And I got interested in complexity science and I invested in a company that was spun out of Santa Fe Institute around uh, using complexity science to solve business problems. And so this whole systemic perspective on, on the challenges really got kind of locked into my own thinking. And I looked in the mirror and said, well, what do you know about? And I know about finance and it occurred to me that finance in general, and specifically the flow of real investment capital, was one of, if not the critical, leverage point to shift the flow or the direction of the economic system. 
Um, I mean, no one who's studied this systemic crisis can, um, can not get depressed from time to time. And I have three children, and I do this work very much out of a, um, um, not a panic, but a, a very strongly motivated, um, you know, this, this matters kind of um, motivation. And, and um, I'm actually working on a book that I'm writing to my children to try to put into some context for them the world I think they're going to live in. So I, I have my own moments of being pretty deeply troubled by all this. Um, but, at, but at the end of the day, um, I'm actually very hopeful. And one of the reasons I'm hopeful is through my understanding of the new biology and this whole emergence idea. And I do think we're, we're participating in an emergence, which is very exciting. And, um, and we don't need to see where the outcome, how it's going to work, in order to remain hopeful. So it's a little bit like you know, you're in a hockey game and it's the third period and you're down four to one, but you just keep playing because there's always a chance that you're going to score four goals. Um, and I, and I, f I, I feel that way. And so every day I go to work, that's what motivates me. And the second reason I'm hopeful is that the more I've learned, the more I think this, this is about seeing the world that exists in a different way. Despite all the problems of industrial agriculture, and they're horrendous, um, only about 30% of the world eats its food from the industrial agriculture system. So 70% of the world is, is eating and growing and preparing food in a way that's much more sustainable than industrial agriculture. Now, there's lots of problems with that. A lot of those people are very, very poor, and there's other issues there. But it doesn't mean we need to shift. You know, the, the industrial agriculture system uh, is not the solution to that. And secondly, you could probably apply a similar percentage to the, the global economy. And, and what we read about in the Wall Street Journal and read about in, in um, New York Times and what Wall Street is focused on is probably only 20% or 30% of the real global economy. And if you count the value of the gift economy and the, um, uh, you know, the, the natural ecosystem services, if you put value on that, you know, the problem part of the economy is it becomes a fairly small percentage of the total system. You know, we have a huge amount of work to do, don't get me wrong. But um, compared to where I came from, which is the whole thing is screwed up, and oh my god, you know, we have no chance. The more I'm working in this, in this field, the more I believe that um, a lot of what we need to do is just shine a light on what's working, improve it qualitatively, um, and then figure out how to crimp the stuff that's horribly wrong. And there is a lot of stuff that's horribly wrong, including how most investment capital flows today, which is into short-term speculative stuff. That, that you know, one could at best argue has no value to society, but I could easily argue has lots of detrimental value to society.